Here's an episode of How to Analyse Poetry from the Learning Cauldron. Today we'll be looking at Liz Lochhead's poem, Last Supper. Analyzing poetry involves identifying and dissecting the literary techniques that the poet has used effectively to explore the theme or themes of a poem. In her poem Last Supper, Liz Lochhead explores the themes of toxic female relationships, romantic relationships, conflict and, to a lesser extent, betrayal and infidelity. The title of the poem Last Supper is interesting. It refers to a biblical event, the final meal that Jesus took with his disciples before the crucifixion. One of the disciples, Judas, betrays Jesus. And this links neatly to the fact that the persona in the poem is preparing a meal for a partner who appears to have betrayed her. In the first stanza, we immediately start with a third person female pronoun. She is getting good and ready to renounce. The alliteration of the R here almost suggests a hint of relish. Then there is also a metaphor whereby the giving up of the relationship is seen to be giving up his actual flesh. This image is further enhanced by the sibilance in his sweet flesh, which sounds distinctly sinister. We wonder what plans she has for him. Then there's another religious reference, Lent, the time that you give up things, which highlights the fact that she is going to be giving up her relationship with him. There's then a caesura here, for and enjoyment ever. So a lovely bit of structure there that you could comment on. There are two minor sentences and the fact that the ever appears on its own really emphasises that this is final. And then the but highlights a change of direction here. Because although she's in planning to, to give up on the relationship and to terminate it, what she's doing now seems rather odd. She is assembling the ingredients for their last treat and treat suggests something positive. The enjambment leaves the word feast at the start of the next line also emphasising the idea of something positive. Then there's the use of parenthesis and a question here, which is interesting. The idea that she is preparing a feast and yet she is preparing to part from him. So that leaves us curious as to why this might be. The use of the question here in parenthesis, showing that it's a comment from the persona herself, leads us to realise that she has started to doubt the relationship and is now thinking that it should come to an end. Moving on, the next part of the stanza shows that she is taking her vengeance out almost on the food initially, in that she's tearing the foliage, scrambling the salad. The use of sibilance here helps to add to this feeling of violence and disorder, and the hiss is almost sinister. There's also assonance with the A sound here. The reference to candles is interesting because obviously a romantic meal would have candles with it, but also it could be a candle lit in memory of the death of the relationship. The next couple of lines here are quite interesting because there's a play on words. We know the phrase, you've made your bed and now you'll have to lie in it. Well, here she slightly changes that phrase and says the table she's made, or rather set, and oh yes, now we'll have to lie on. The use of the parenthesis there giving a chatty tone. So it's a slight reformulation of that familiar phrase there. The implication here is that she has got herself into this situation by having a relationship with this partner, and so now she's having to deal with the situation of her own making. There's a reference to silverware, which suggests she's taken out the, the best dinner service in order to create the right atmosphere for this meal, and yet we already have the impression it's not going to be the sort of romantic meal that you would anticipate. She refers to the perfect of the way she's cooked the vegetables. Nicely al dente. Look at the enjoyment over there. The cooked goose is also worthy of our attention here, not only because of the assonance of the oo and oo sound, which draws our attention to it, but the fact that there's both a literal meaning and a figurative meaning. If someone cooks your goose, it means they set you up to fail effectively and suffer consequences, but she may literally also have been preparing a cooked goose. The next sentence starts with an emphatic he, third person masculine pronoun, which is obviously referring to the, the love or the partner that she's preparing the meal for. And we've got a lovely alliteration here of bring the bottle plus, unexpectedly, betrayal with a kiss. And this is another reference to the Last Supper when Judas betrayed Jesus by kissing him. In the same way, the reader is led to believe that the partner has betrayed the persona in the poem. It's interesting to note that the masculine third person pronouns do not appear often. There are far more she's and they's referring to the friends later on. So he gets minimal coverage, if you like. And as we move on to the second stanza, it's a perfect opportunity to reflect on the fact that Liz Lochhead does not do the predictable here. We've got a wronged woman, but rather than dwell on that, she looks at how this woman will then behave in this scenario after the event is over, once she has effectively told the partner that the relationship is over, and she's discussing it with her friends. So let's have a look at how that pans out. Already she 
the wronged persona, was imagining it done with at this feast. Now, feast takes us back to the reference to feast earlier on. The persona is already thinking ahead to what it will be like once this meal, where she is going to ditch her lover, is over, and the leftover hash, that's a sort of mess when you've got leftovers, that she would make of it when she's discussing the whole situation with her friends. When it was just, and the word choice of the girls. So, a group of her close friends, and the capital T and capital G here really draws attention to the strength of that friendship group. And then there's a reference, a very clear reference to Macbeth, when those three met again, and that's a reference to the quote, when shall we three meet again, the witches in Macbeth are a supernatural and threatening force in the play, so therefore that makes us wonder about this friendship group. Now we move from talking about a literal feast, the one that she prepared as the Last Supper, onto a metaphorical feast, and this one includes soup, and lo- notice the assonant qualities of good and soup here to just draw it out, that she could render from the bones the carcass of this relationship. And the use of sibilance here is particularly effective. We have soup, she, bones, something substantial, something extra tasty. All those essays create a highly sinister feel, and we realise that they are actually enjoying picking over the remains of the relationship. The repetition here of something creates a parallel structure, and it almost hints that it's difficult to put into words what it is that the pleasure that they get out of this process. One of the main things to note about stanza three is that it is full of sound techniques. I'll just nip through those first before we look at the other aspects because there's a lot of imagery as well. So we've got the onomatopoeic sound of cackling and then that's emphasised by the alliteration of cackling around the cauldron. Once again, harking back to the idea of them being like witches and something sinister. And that sinister tone is definitely helped by the sibilance here spitting out the grislier bits of his giblets. And it's added to in fact, by the assonance of the short I sound, spitting and grisly bits and his and giblets. So there's a lot you could say about that, just in general, about how it helps to create a sinister tone and really makes us feel quite uncomfortable about the behaviour of the persona in the poem and her friends. The sound continues with the repeated n sound gnawing on the knuckle bone of some intricate irony. And then more alliteration again, getting grave. And then the A sound here, assonance, grave and dainty at the petit goût, we'll come back to that in a second, mouthfuls of reported speech. So lots of sound there, but there's also a lot of imagery because this idea of their process of dismantling the relationship verbally afterwards is continued with the imagery of the feast and how they are enjoying and chewing up all the details of the relationship. There's almost a cannibalistic feeling here here when they're talking about spitting out his giblets, that's a sort of part of his innards. So after they have indulged themselves in this, what one could call, but probably not in your exam answer, a bitch fest, talking about him in rather unpleasant terms, they then start looking at less gluttonous mouthfuls. So putty goo is a French dining term for a small amount of something. So there's a contrast between their indulgence and gluttony here, and then suddenly having little morsels. So after the reference to reported speech at the end of stanza three, we we move on to the first and only direct speech in this poem. That's rich. They, and that's a reference to the friends, the camaraderie of the coven, if you like, splutter. So they're outraged on behalf of their friend. And this description here, this imagery that's used here is amazing. Munching the lies, fat and sizzling as sausages. So that's a simile there, um, comparing the lies to large sausages. And of course, the use of the sibilance, all these essays here, almost conveys the sound of fat spitting out of these sausages. So it's very effective. And then they, once again, the reference to this group, they, this is all of them, they'd sink back gorged. There's something unpleasant about the word gorged. It suggests gluttony, that you've had too much of something. Um, So there's excess here. And then there's an unusual oxymoron here, because you've got the juxtaposition of savage, which is a rather negative word, uh, with integrity, which is a positive word. And it highlights the hypocrisy of these women, that they're acting as if they're holier than thou because their friend has been wronged, but actually they're not behaving too well themselves. And this is very reflective, sometimes of a, it's a truthful reflection of the way that women can be when they get together to dissect something that's happened. It's a rather toxic situation. And then here the sound, the assonant qualities of sleek and preening all seem to add to the rather unpleasant description and portrayal of these women as they gather together to pour over the remains of their friend's relationship. It's also worth noting here the imagery comparing these women to corbies, which is a Scottish word for carrion crows. And carrion crows feast on dead flesh, effectively. So that isn't a very uh, pleasant portrayal of these women, but it's very 
vivid. They're bright eyes blinking. We've got the two B sounds there, which is very effective in making them seem alive and satisfied. Look how this stands on its own here, making it stand out. And it implies that they've gorged themselves until they're absolutely full of all the bitching that they've effectively done through this process. But there's something even worse that comes at the end, till somebody would get hungry and go hunting again. So we've got the assonance of the uh sound in hungry and hunting, which really makes those two words stand out. And the word again, this suggests that this process has happened more than once and that it could happen again. So it portrays these women as rather misandristic, so they are effectively man-hating, and that they see men as prey. And this suggests double standards. So rather than doing the obvious, being sorry for the person who's being wronged, this lockhead has rather turned it on its head and she's portrayed the other side, whereby there can be toxic female relationships where women actually enjoy pouring over the details of such uh, an unpleasant relationship when it comes to an end. So what we see here is that there's a contrast between what we've just been reading about in these last three stanzas, this gluttonous meal with overindulgence, and the rather fine and proper meal that she sets out to prepare as the last supper. This contrast shocks the reader because it's so different from the meal that is described at the outset, but it emphasises the toxicity of this friendship group when they get together to dissect the relationship. All four stanzas in this poem are written in free verse, so that's worth noting, and tone wise it veers from purposeful initially as she's preparing the meal, there are hints of humour throughout, and then by the ending it, the tone is distinctly sinister. I hope that's been helpful. See you next time. In other videos we analyse more of Liz Lochhead's poems. If you found this or any of our other videos useful, it would be great if you could subscribe to the YouTube channel. Thanks for your support.